everybody! Well, if you haven't seen any of the previous videos, now is when we normally say, Hey, Pete! So let's try it again, shall we? Hey, everybody! Well, I can't hear you, but I'm going to assume that that was much better. Today I'm going to go over how I built the Game of Thrones Hall of Faces. But before I do that, I want to acknowledge that we've been gone for two years. And if we had any fans, you might have been wondering, Hey, what happened to Pete and Tiffy? Did they go the way of Toys R Us? No, not so much. Just hold your horses there, geek speakers. First we got married, and it was a time of great joy. So much so that when quarantine hit, I looked like this. But after a month, I looked like this, and wasn't too interested in uploading videos. But quarantine hasn't been all bad. It gave me the time to work on my toy photography. I joined a group called Articulated Comic Book Art, ACBA. And it's really given me the chance to, to hone my skills. And recently I've gotten into making my own dioramas for the, the backgrounds of my photography. And I gotta tell you, it's super rewarding. It speaks to the, the artist in me that has been alive ever since I was a little kid. So without further ado, let's jump into why you're here. Let's see how we make the Game of Thrones Hall of Faces. The first thing I do is I cut out the pieces of insulation foam. Uh, you can get this pretty much at any hardware store. Uh, there, it comes in several different kinds. There's the pink, which is what I'm using here. Uh, you can also find the, the blue. I think uh, it depends on which store you have. They don't always carry both different kinds. Uh, personally, I like the, the pink better because it's harder, meaning that when you indent it and you, you're scoring the, the material, it's going to keep it better, whereas the, the blue stuff is going to make it, uh, since it's a little bit softer, it's not going to keep the indentation as much. Uh, before I cut out these pieces, what I did was I measured them and cut them out using a, uh, a square. So these are 16 by 16 pieces. As you're doing this, you'll start to notice that some of the pieces have a natural bow to them. So what I'm doing here is I'm seeing how they fit together most naturally, and I'm labeling them so that I don't get confused. And I'm just putting on the back of each one uh, left with a, a, a um, with an arrow pointing up or back wall so I know what it is that I'm working with and don't get confused. The person who requested this is specifically going to be using it for Mythic Legions, which is an awesome line of toys that gives you all different kinds of, of races, like everything from humans to, to goblins to, to orcs, and he wants to be able to display all of the, the different heads. So what I'm doing here is that I'm starting to, to measure the heads because I want to make sure that it's um, going to be able to fit the different races. So though it's intentionally rough at the edges, the, um, the, the final product is going to look uh, somewhat unfinished. This is, there's actually a more measuring in this piece than I've ever done. What I'm doing here is I'm drawing a straight line so that I'll know where I can uh, start to, to cut the holes for the, the faces. If you want to have a, a level straight line, there's two different ways that you can go about it. The first you can do is buy a square, which uh, you'll see me use here in a little bit. Uh, it's literally just an L-shaped piece of, of material that allows you to uh, fit it against the edge so that you can uh, so that you can um, have a, a 90 degree angle. The other thing that you can do is if you're working from a, a clean surface, meaning one that's not rough, you can just measure up from each side. So you can measure uh, two inches from each side and then connect the, the lines. Here you can see me making little marks at uh, certain spots. Uh, what I'm doing is uh, starting to figure out where the, the spaces are going to be and if they're going to be big enough for the, the various heads. Now that I have my little hash marks made where I'd like my lines to go, I've uh, brought up my little square. 
I have two different versions of this tool. I have one that, that you see here and another one that is significantly bigger, about two feet long. The uh, problem with that one, although as you can see I'm not able to get all the way to the, the end of my phone here, the, the bigger one is too big and it's great for being able to cut out the, the large pieces of foam but it doesn't allow me to uh, work in this space. I'd have to use it on the floor. So what I'll do here is draw my lines and then flip the foam over so I can uh, match up the, the same line on the other side. Now that you can see I have my lines drawn out, uh, you can also see that not only do I have the the individual lines, but they're double lines to, to leave space for the, the shelf wall. Uh, if you were to just measure out what you, um, uh, not having the, the double line, then you're not going to give yourself enough space for the actual structure. Now you can see that the, the there's a grid structure, and from here uh, that I've got all of my lines and I've got enough space for the, the shelving and for the, the walls of the individual spaces, from here, I'm going to start using a burning tool to cut through the, the foam. The, the burning tool allows you very quickly to just kind of poke through. The problem is that it does not leave precise edges. And in this particular case, that's not a bad thing because I wanted to have more of a, a rough look to, to match what it looks like in the Game of Thrones. However, if you are looking for a smooth edge, then I'd suggest you go with a, a razor blade, an X-Acto blade, or a craft knife. It's probably going to give you a, a better cut. This particular dial wasn't so much hard as it was tedious. There's just a lot of slow work that you can't get around. The, the, the burning tool, and keep in mind this is in double speed, it just takes a long time to, to burn through. I forget the exact count of how many faces or how many holes I have for, for faces, but I know on this primary sheet there was 24. I ended up making two of, of this. I had only planned on making one of this wall. So um, two large walls, two smaller walls, and then two pillars. I think that the, the in overall count ended up being around 60, spa 60 faces. Now that I have my final one cut out, I wanted to see what the heads looked like. So like any self-respecting toy collector, I have many bins of spare parts, including a bin of heads. So I wanted to line up to see what they would look like in there. Seeing that they all fit and they can accommodate various sizes of the heads, I'm fairly satisfied and can start going into some of the detail work. For these cuts, I'd like to use my hot wire cutter. If you look at it, you can see that mine has been well used. Uh, it's interesting, there aren't a lot of these on the, the market, or at least not available online. Uh, this one, I... I, I, I can't really say whether I recommend it or not, having not used other ones, but it works well enough. It, as you can see by its size, it's a little bit limited. It can, as if you're looking to, to measure it with the bar that I just moved, you only have so much room to, to play with, so it can be a little bit uh, frustrating that way. Uh, here I'm using a very imprecise method. You may have seen I was just digging my fingernails into it to uh, form the line, so I'm just uh, kind of eyeballing it and matching it up. And when you use your hot wire cutter, there are different settings for the the heat. Uh, I keep mine pretty low. I keep it at about a three, so I have to go relatively slow as I move through. However, what that does is it keeps it from breaking quite as often. It also means I don't have to worry quite so much about burning myself on the hot wire because if you have it up too high, you'll see the wire will literally start to, to glow uh, red, white, hot, and uh, not really looking to feel what that, not really looking to find out what that feels like. 
The detail work that I'm starting to put in here is just the, the various ledges. One of the things that I have uh, kind of a little bone to pick when I see some of the, the dials that I've made in the, the past is that they can be very flat. And I mean this in two different ways. I mean, they can literally be flat where it's just a, a wall and nothing jutting out from it. Uh, or they can also be flat, meaning that they are flat in color, uh, just one layer of color, which if you look at anything in nature or anything man-made, it's really not just one color. Often you'll see that, that even a, a single wall that's painted one color has multiple tones in it. So getting, the, uh, getting it to, to look a little bit more three-dimensional is absolutely going to make your piece start to, to feel more alive. So I'm adding various ledges. And for, uh, for this, I wasn't too concerned with looking exactly like the, the, the Game of Thrones Hall of Faces. I'm just trying to approximate it so that at first glance you, you would recognize it, but if you are comparing what it actually looked like in the show compared to what I've done here, you'll see that they're, they're not identical. And my skill level hasn't progressed to the level where I could do something that intricate and, and be identical. But you can definitely look at it and know what it is that you're, you're looking at. I was lucky enough that the person who commissioned this uh, authorized me, said just your take on, on what it would be. So uh, that made it easier for me. Uh, I'm using hot glue, so I use hot glue on all of my foam to, to keep it together. Uh, I like it for a couple of reasons. One, it is uh, quick, so it, it only takes a few seconds for it to, to dry. And uh, two, it, uh, it doesn't eat through, so you have to be careful with foam. There are certain things you absolutely cannot use. Most spray paints, unless it specifically says it's it's made for foam, will eat through your 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 styrofoam uh, very quickly too, and uh, to a point where you can absolutely ruin your your set if you if you spray some on there. And that's also true with a lot of different glues. So uh, hot glue does not burn through it, provided that you have it on the lower setting. The higher setting will work for the thicker pieces, but if you've cut anything thin like the, the ledge that I have, the higher setting for, for most hot glue guns will, will burn right through it. So you have to be careful there. From here, I'm starting to cut out the the, the pillars. So this particular piece has four walls and two pillars, which gives you a lot of versatility for it. Since I'm using nothing but the, the hot foam, I'm cutting, uh, excuse me, not hot foam, the, the styrofoam, I'm cutting from the thicker styrofoam. Uh, by the way, it comes in two different sizes. It comes in an inch and half inch. So most of what I'm using is the, the half inch, but for these pillars, I wanted to be fairly large, so I'm cutting out uh, three sections of the one inch that I can then glue together uh, to form the, the main structure for the pillar. Again, I'm just going to use hot glue to put all of these to, together. Um, I'm not really sure if I'm using too much or, or too little, but I wanted to make sure that it stays, so I'm putting it uh, fairly evenly through throughout with hot glue as the, the name suggests it it uh, you got to use it while it's hot so it's important that you don't dilly dally while you're you're putting this together you want to be able to uh, put it down and then glue it which of course gives it its limitations because it's very easy to uh, glue something in the, the wrong spot now, if you notice, I only put glue on one side with that particular piece, and the reason for it is that later I'm going to be cutting into this to, to make the, the, uh, the alcoves for the faces, so I didn't want to have to cut through the, the hot glue, so I just placed it on the, the back, which is still enough to, to hold it together.
So the design for, for this piece changed as it went along. I had originally planned on doing three walls and two pillars and putting them in the, the corner, as you can see here. Uh, but then as it evolved, I realized we wanted to, uh, actually it was the, the, the person who commissioned it wanted greater flexibility and they wanted to add another large wall. So um, I didn't magnetize these as I normally would because it would, uh, it would make it so that you had to put it in a certain configuration. And with it being that big, it didn't seem like that was going to be the, the best way to go. Once again, I'm measuring out and I'm using my square to to get the the right lines. For this one, I decided to keep them fairly even with the uh, the first wall that I created. If you look at the show, the the pillars are not necessarily on the the same level. Uh, even different walls that will start at different uh, different heights. Uh, but I thought it would just for the scale that we're looking at, it would probably look better to have them all the the same height, and that's what I'm doing here. So just measuring out, and then you'll see that it's uh, a little, it's repetitive. I'm measuring, burning, measuring, burning. After I burned through the primary, it was pretty hard to to get everything out from that angle. It was easier when you're just punching a hole, but it's different. It's different when you're trying to uh, work through without punching the hole. So I'm using an old sculpting tool to 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 bore out some of the the excess material. I think uh, if I had thought about it ahead of time, it might have been easier to to use a Dremel. Uh, so that's probably the route that I would go next time. And it's starting to take shape. It's not there yet, but you can start to see what it's going to look like at the end. With the first wall and the first pillar, uh, of course not completed, but just roughed out so you can uh, get a feel for, for where the spaces are going to be. And I'm just going to cut a small base mostly for stability at this point, but then I later decide to, to beef it up even further. I decided to uh, use the same burning tool to cut off the edge so it didn't look square and can look a little bit more hexagonal. Uh, and then because that burning tool will um, leave such a, a rough edge, then now I'm trying to sand it down. This is not going to be my final edge. I just want to be able to sand it down so that I can add to it without looking too... Um, uh, bumpy, I guess, which is interesting because I'm later going to go out of my way to try to make it look bumpy so and, and, and more rough, but I just didn't like the, the burned look. So some of the tools that you're going to want to keep on hand, uh, various sandpaper. I've got, um, I think for that I was using a medium grit, but I also have a fine grit to to really smooth it out at the, the end. I don't use anything too coarse because with the pink, it's rather than sanding, it's going to just tear it up and it, it comes out in these tiny little chunks, which then you can see exactly how it's, it's actually just foam. Here you can see I glued a wall onto that diagonal piece that I cut out just so it have a nice smooth end at, the, um, at that finish. From here, I'm going to spare you a lot of the, the detail. I started to make tiny cuts so that each little alcove would have the, these pillars. So uh, I'm going to skip way ahead, but just know that there are literally hundreds and hundreds of tiny pieces that are in this, this build. You'll get to see them. And you can see the, the smallest thing uh, that I cut. That ended up breaking off, and it felt like it wasn't worth it to try to replace it. But there are other things that are uh, fairly uh, small, and it just took forever. So I'm coming to the end of the detail work. Remember, this is just the first wall that I'm working on. And at this point, I probably have close to about four hours invested in this piece. It's a monster. 
Now we're into the next day. I've got the second wall mostly done. As you can see, I have the two pillars in the background and, and they have a significant more detail. I have increased the, the base. I did that by just making the thin cuts and, and wrapping the, the foam around. You can wrap it if it's thin enough. It's still going to, to crack a little bit, but it looks okay. And I'm just sanding down some of the edges so they look uh, a little bit more round. But uh, I go through and I add more of the, the pillars around the, the alcoves. And again, just very, very, very time consuming. Uh, from start to finish, including all, all the panels and the pillars and the, the, the cutting, the, the sanding, the uh, texturizing, the, the painting, I spent the better part of three full days on this piece. So um, I would estimate realistically that that amounts to somewhere between 20 and 30 hours of, of work. I want to show you some of the, the smaller cuts that, that I'm making so you can see uh, what those look like. Uh, these are not the smallest, but these are just to, to give it the appearance of having uh, pillars. So uh, I've already cut them out and cut them very thinly. And now I'm just placing them to make sure that they, they fit. If you look closely, you'll see that they fit into some and not in others. So the one that I'm just placing there is, uh, it's too big and it's going to need to be cut down. But the one that's all the way at the bottom, you'll see that the pillars are too small and there's going to be a little bit of space left be between. Again, this was uh, partially intentional because I uh, made the all the alcoves different sizes to accommodate the different races of the, the heads that he's going to be putting in. But it does mean that uh, one size does not fit all when it comes to the cuts. Here's one of the techniques that I learned from Tiffy. You can see if you look at the, the pink on the, the one in my right hand, how rough it looks compared to the other one, which is significantly smoother. So uh, when using, when, when trying to make anything look a little bit more weathered, you have to get rid of all of those smooth surfaces. So I'm literally just taking a rock and going over it. Uh, I've also used a bit of bunched up uh, tin foil. Uh, I find the, the rock is more likely to give me um, more random indents rather than looking like the exact same pattern over and over again. So it can be a, a bit time consuming, but the great thing about this is that when you do uh, put your first layer of black paint, that's going to get all stuck in there and then uh, allow you to dry brush easier so that you'll, you'll have more of that layered look with the with the color. After you have done all of your, your building, including cutting and gluing and texturizing, then the next step is to start painting. And uh, I highly, highly, highly recommend that the first step that you do with your, your painting is that you make it all black. Uh, you're going to find that it's just going to make it so much easier because getting it later is going to uh, be harder to get into all of the, the various cracks and uh, you just don't want any hint of that pink to show up. So I'm using acrylic paint. I've watered it down a little bit so that it's probably about two parts paint, one part water. And this is going to make it easier for me to to go back and forth and uh, just get it into all of the, the crevices. You look how easily that's, that's spreading now that I've poured it out. Once you've gone through and uh, covered the entire surface with the, the black, I would recommend going over it with a blow dryer and getting rid of any of the shiny spots. If it's shiny, if you're using a flat paint, which I recommend that you do, then it's still going to be wet. Uh, go over it with a hair dryer. This will cut your drying time down uh, where it could have been hours. It'll cut it down to, to minutes. So if you're like me and you're impatient and you want to get on with the, the next level hair dryer is an absolute must. 
Uh, once you've done that, though, you're going to find that you don't have nearly as even a coat as you thought you did, and you're going to have to go over some of the other spots with, with some more paint. Uh, for whatever reason, you just don't see it as much when it's wet, so try to look at it from every angle, so this way you can be sure that you don't have any of that, that pink showing through, because it absolutely will show up if you're taking any kind of uh, action figure photography. You'll probably also notice it because it's such an unnatural color in your, your diorama, you'll notice it if it's even just sitting on your shelf. Referring back to the reference material, one of the things that I noticed is that the the stones, uh, the whole setting looks both dry and cool. Uh, so when I say dry, I mean like it doesn't look uh, damp and moist. It doesn't look like it's uh, got any of that moisture in there. Um, specifically, the color for, for moisture when you're talking about stone is green. So I've kept all of the, the green out of it, and uh, but I've also noticed that it looks very cool. And typically the color for making something look cool is blue. So I've covered uh, all of them after I did the, the, the black, I covered them with a very, very light kind of a sky baby blue. And then uh, that was my, my first layer of paint. And I can't stress enough how important multiple layers of, of paint are. So here you see me dry brushing on my third layer of, of paint. And this one is a, a gray. And gray is interesting because it comes in so many different shades. Uh, but more importantly than the shades, it also comes in so many different um, feelings of, of warmth. Uh, and if you notice, this gray feels a little bit warm. It's got a slight tinge of pink to it, in my opinion. So uh, when I put this, this gray on, uh, I felt like it took my cooler piece and made it just a little bit warmer than what I was looking for. Um, but although I still like having that in there, I still I think that the the gray that they they show is uh, just a little bit warm. It's just the lighting that makes it so cool. Um, but I'm going to go over this with a another layer at the end. So that's going to make it four layers of of paint, five if you count the the different the the second layer of black that I added for for each. Uh, and if I wanted to keep making it look more and more realistic, I could easily put in another layer or two and then go back and add the, the dry brushed highlights and the, the wash, the, the water down for the, all the, the crevices to, to really get in there. For my final step, I added a, a wash. And you can see this is significantly darker than what it was before. I mixed uh, gray with three different blues, a, a dark blue, uh, more of a gray blue, and then just a, a touch of, of black, trying to give it more of that, that darker look. The darker color also hides some of the imperfections. Uh, so here is where you start to see that it really starts to look more al alive and more realistic. So uh, again, your, your steps are black base, secondary color that you're probably going to cover up that you just want to have a hint of. In this case, it was uh, a baby blue. Then uh, some, some dry brushing and then a wash. If you want to bring out the highlights and really see the, the crisp edges, then I'd recommend doing the wash before the, the dry brushing, but I, I didn't want it to, to look particularly crisp here. When you're finished, your dio should look roughly like this. Notice the, the variation in color, and notice how uh, it's, it's not flat, not from any, any sense. It's, it sticks out, certain colors are going to pop a little bit more. So that's it. I want to thank you for joining me. I hope that you've enjoyed this tutorial. If you do like this and you'd like to see more diorama builds and you want to see more on action figure photography, please hit the subscribe button and uh, follow me if you'd like to see more of my work. 
head over to Open Box Mafia on Facebook. It's like your favorite bar where we sit around and talk about all things related to toys and pop culture. It's just a, a ton of fun. So until then, adios and respect your shelf.